Hello and welcome to Bios Frontier Science. Today, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Paul Michel, professor at Stanford Medicine. To help host this episode, I'm joined by my colleague, Drew Yasher. Paul, can you kick things off with a brief introduction of yourself for us, please? Sure. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here with the two of you. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm Paul Michel. I am a physician scientist. I'm a professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Pathology at Stanford Medicine, and I'm an institute scholar at Serafin ChemH at Stanford University. Thank you, Paul. Before we dive too deeply into your work, which we're incredibly excited to talk about, one question we like to ask our guests. Throughout your career, as you mentioned, you've been a physician and a scientist. What, in your case, has been your North Star, the common thread, if you will, that's tied your work together? Sure. It's a great question. Uh, the North Star for me is, without a doubt, making a difference for people with cancer. I lost my father to stomach cancer when I was 14 years old, and my father died a very difficult death. It was a very painful death, really, frankly, a horrible death. And as a, I vividly remember as a 14, 15 year old boy uh, making a decision that I really wanted to do something about cancer. Um, and so I trained first as a pathologist. Well, I went to medical school first. Uh, I wrote in my college essay, actually my wife found it, uh, that I wanted to become a doctor and do cancer research. I, uh, I went to medical school. Uh, and then I became a pathologist to look the enemy in the eyes. And then I realized I'd spend the rest of my life looking the enemy in the eyes and that science was the path. So I trained in science and then I lived multiple lives, first a purely clinical life. And then I lived a translational life. And then I lived a pure basic science research life. And now I integrate all of them because my real goal is to make a difference for patients with cancer. Oh, it's absolutely phenomenal. And it's clear you've more than lived up to your promise to yourself and to the admissions folks in your, uh, in your college essay. And so passing it over to Drew now to dive deeper into this uh, journey you undertook to Molecular Bio and to the founding of the Michelle Lab and what you do today. Drew? Thanks so much, Chris. Um, Paul, your, your journey to oncology was a circuitous one. You began your career as a philosophy student, then transitioned to pursue medicine with a specialization in neuropathology before settling in molecular biology research. Can you tell us more about your journey and what motivated you along the way? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I, I tell this to people. Um, I think we're very good at making sense and telling our stories backwards. Like you tell the story story and everything makes sense. And that's really how we write our lives. When we're going forward, there's all sorts of zigs and zags and false stars. I'm going to tell the story backwards, but there are parts of it. I'll also tell you parts of it where the story really is forwards. But, but basically the things that really took me along that journey were both personal and thematic. Um, for example, well, my father was a philosophy professor, so one doesn't have to be Sigmund Freud to figure out why I majored in philosophy as an undergrad. I mean, it is a very appealing topic, but the truth is I really was probably trying to find a piece of my dad, you know, and I really believed in the idea of a liberal arts education. Um, so it was a very good time to wander a little bit. After I finished that is when I really started on fire about wanting to go into medicine. I already, I already had that goal, but I wasn't quite ready for it until I finished college. And then I really went after it. So, um, and then I, I, I studied pathology and neuropathology, again, pathology to look the enemy in the eyes and neuropathology, because I found the brain beautiful. Um, and I thought that that was going to be a very important route. It's very interesting. Neuropathology is a specialty in which a lot of actually the lead geneticists in the world are actually neuropathologists. Um, from Michael Stratton, who ran the, you know, the whole uh, Cancer Grand Challenge and did the seminal work on uh, mutational signatures of cancer, Curry Svensson, you know, all of these folks were actually neuropathologists. It's a very interesting route. And, uh, and I was very, very well trained by somebody named Harry Venters at UCLA. It was a wonderful launching point, but it was really only the beginning for me. 
as you described, Paul, um, from the beginning, you had a focus on, on the mind and, and through your current work, you bridge cancer genetics and signal transduction and cellular metabolism to better understand the molecular mechanisms behind cancer development, progression and drug resistance with the aim of developing more efficacious and less toxic therapies. Starting with your efforts to understand glioblastomas at the genomic level, can you give us an overview of your work here? Yeah, I'm very happy to tell you the story because there really was a very natural progression, which I would not have been able to predict. So when I started, um, I, uh, I was very interested in brain cancer because it was a very natural area for me to go, both from my training as a neuropathologist and because I had done my postdoc with somebody named Lou Reichert at UCSF. He was a Howard Hughes investigator, really extraordinary uh, scientist and extraordinary person. Incidentally, he was the first person, I believe, who climbed both Mount Everest and K2, which says a lot about him. He was very extraordinary. And I had the pleasure of actually learning molecular biology from last year's Nobel Prize winner, Ardem Padapudian. We were lab mates at the same time in Lou's lab. So it was a fabulous experience. And I was ready to take what I'd learned about signal transduction biology and neuropathology and go after brain cancer, glioblastoma. And there was a huge unmet clinical need. And the work progressed very well um, in the sense that I think we were making a lot of scientific progress and we were writing very good papers. My work caught the attention of Charles Sawyers, who was at UCLA at the time, and Charles had uh, just done his seminal work with Gleevec and, uh, and CML. And uh, Charles was very interested in, could you target tumor suppressor losses and saw my work and we were quantifying signal transduction. And just as a, a little aside, in those days, this was very early translational medicine. It's like 1998. And if you were a physician scientist, what you were supposed to do is you're supposed to have a clinical life and a basic research life. And I was doing this and I thought, this is insane. Here I am studying signal transduction in frog eggs, and I'm getting call to the operating room for these, you know, to diagnose these clinical samples. And just, it doesn't, they don't talk to each other. And I decided that they should. So I started studying and quantifying signaling transduction in patient samples. And that work began to shed light. And uh, in close interactions with Charles Sawyers, we ended up publishing a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that caught a lot of attention. And my, my career was more than launched. Everything was going well. I was advancing. Um, but there was a problem. What really bothered me was that the science was advancing and the patients were not getting better. And that really bothered me. I felt we we're missing something. And in 2011, um, the summer of 2011, uh, at first my wife thought I was crazy, but then she was all on board. I said, let's go to Paris for the summer and do a mini sabbatical. I want to think. So we went to Paris and part of it was that my uncle Walter Michel was there. And I was telling Chris, uh, Walter was my father's brother and Walter was a very famous psychologist. He did the marshmallow test, all the delay of gratification work. He's a very famous Stanford professor. And he, after my father died, he became a father figure and then a mentor and, a, and then a friend. Um, and in 2011, we spent the summer together in Paris and I spent a lot of time talking with him. And he convinced me to have the courage to go not where the light is. We typically go from what we know and understand in science and we go to the next step, but he convinced me, go where nobody really understands anything. And I was very struck by a problem that nobody understood, which is how can cancers seem to change their genomes so fast? It made no sense. Because, you know, way back in 1976, a very forward thinker named Peter Knoll had come up with this idea that in cancer, all of the cells are not the same. You can have different mutations and the tumor is essentially an ecosystem and that the tumor evolves over time so that when you treat the patient, you select for cells that are most resistant to the treatment. This was called the clonal evolution model. So the idea would be that the tumor should change over time, but it should change slowly because evolution is essentially a slow process through selection. Um, 
And that's a very appealing hypothesis, but you couldn't really do it until single cell technologies were on board. Well, once we had those, and this was the work of a really talented graduate student in the lab at the time, David Nathanson, who's now a professor at UCLA, we started going after this problem. And what we discovered was shocking in two ways. First of all, the tumors did change in the way that you would expect. That is that you, they change the composition and they get rid of the cells that were most sensitive to the drug. And if you took the drug away, they would change back. But the kinetics were all wrong. It happened way, way, way too fast. And then the second thing was that everything we learned about classical genetics says that mother cells could, should give rise to daughter cells that are genetically like them. So for example, if you took a tumor cell that had a lot of an amplified receptor or one that had very little of the amplified receptor, and you put it into a dish or you put it into a mouse, the one with a lot of the amplified receptor should give rise to a tumor with a lot of amplified receptor. And the one with little should give rise to little, except that isn't what happened. That is every single cell could give rise to the original tumor with its full spectrum of heterogeneity. And that made zero sense by classical genetics. So we ended up doing what we probably should have done in the first place. We looked. Because in the old days, right, people actually used to look at chromosomes in cancer cells. And um, effectively, the only time where you can really look is when a cell is getting ready to divide. Because actually, the DNA inside the nucleus of a cell is in a complex three-dimensional jumble. And that complex three-dimensional jumble actually determines which genes are expressed. Now, that's why a liver cell is a liver cell and a kidney cell is a kidney cell. But when the cell's getting ready to, to divide and the chromosomes line up, then you can actually tell where genes are localized. So we went to look at this and the surprise was that all of the oncogene, in this case, it was the epidermal growth factor receptor, a particular form of it uh, that was mutated and very active, um, that it was all not on chromosomes where things were supposed to be, but all extra chromosomal DNA. And that when we treated with a drug, the DNA disappeared. Now this was made no sense, right? You're treating with a drug that targets a kinase and the DNA is disappearing. And then you remove the drug and it all comes back again on extra chromosomal DNA. So we published this in science in 2014 to what I would call a colossal scratching of heads. People thought, well, that's weird. Glioblastoma, that's an odd genomically unstable tumor. But I remember thinking something. So I, after I talk about it in public, people would come up to me with um, maps of the cancer genome because we're living in a world of precision medicine. And this was really based upon two things. The first is we have a map of the chromosomes, right? We know where genes are located. We map this, you know, the first map that, you know, semi-complete, but not fully complete in about 2001. And then we actually have technologies like next generation sequencing so that you could actually take the reads and you could put it to the map. So you think you know where tumors act, where what's gone wrong in a tumor, and you know exactly what it is and where it's gone wrong, where, where it's either the sequence has become corrupted or you have too many or too few copies. Well, after, I, after the 2014 science paper, people would come to me and they'd say, um, you know, I think um, the oncogene, what you, what you study is interesting, but the oncogene I study, MYC, for example, it's on chromosome eight. And I'd say, well, how do you know? And they'd pull out a cancer genome atlas map. You know, the world had spent billions of dollars on mapping cancer genomes. And all I could think of was Ptolemy's map of the solar system. Um, which was, you know, in the old days, right, <laughs> the astronomers looked up at the night sky and they made these precise measurements of the planets moving across the heavens. The measurements were really good, but the maps were dead wrong because they put the earth in the center of it. And I had this moment of, oh my God, is this what's actually happening? I remember I was actually in the shower when the realization hit. It was like, well, okay, how are the reference maps made? Well, they're coming from normal cells. So hold on a second. So that means that we have an inference that things are in tumor cells where they are in normal cells. And wait, you mean we hadn't looked? So at that time, a computer scientist at UCSD named Vinit Bafna, who's, he'd actually worked with Craig Venter on the sequencing of the human genome. And Vinit came to me and said, I think you're right. And we began working together. He's a brilliant computational uh, scientist. And we decided that what we really needed to do was to integrate the old with the new, which is to say the what 
which we could get by next generation sequencing, with the where, which we could do by looking at cells while they were dividing. So we did this across lots and lots of tumors of different types. And this was spearheaded by somebody named Kristen Turner, uh, who was a brilliant postdoc in the lab who now works at Boundless Bio, which I can tell you about. But the idea, what we ended up finding was that this extra chromosomal DNA was omnipresent and that all of the oncogenes that we knew were important were amplified in extra chromosomal DNA. Now, People had seen these little dots back in 1965 in pediatric tumors. In the late 1970s, a a, uh, uh, you know, someone named Robert Schimke, a scientist at Stanford, Jeff Wall, others were doing really fascinating work. But this was way before its time and way before the tools. And essentially, it sort of disappeared as, as more advanced technologies came on board. So people had seen this, but it was thought to be very rare and of unknown significance, 1.4% of all cancers, according to the Middleman database. But there it was. We published this in Nature in 2017, and that's when things really began to change. And then we began to realize that we needed to uh, interact uh, more closely with others who could help us think this through. And that's where our colleague Howard Chang came into the picture. I gave a talk at Stanford. Um, and Howard is, had developed this technology with Will Greenleaf called Attack Seek which allowed you to map the chromatin accessibility. And Howard came up to me afterwards and said, you know, Paul, I think we're seeing signals of chromatin accessibility that may be emanating from this extra chromosomal DNA that you're finding. And that started a uh, collaboration that continues to this day and was one of the key reasons that brought me to Stanford. Um, and as we began to work together, we, uh, in a work that was led by Sihan Wu, as well as Kristen Turner, Nam Nguyen, and others, um, Sihan is now an assistant professor at UT Southwestern, we, we began to really map the structure of these, showing that they were in fact circular particles and that they were highly amplified. And this began to open some very important new doors. And at this point, it hit the New York Times and people began to see it. We made a, a number of discoveries about this along the way, sequentially over time that have re resulted in a series of papers in Nature and Nature Genetics. And I'll summarize them. First, because of the non... so. Normally, when chromosomes, when a cell divides, the chromosomes go equally to each daughter cell. But extra chromosomal DNAs lack centromeres. So this has a profound implication. Let's just say you had three copies of a gene, and when the cell was getting ready to divide, it would make six and parcel to each daughter three. But if it's on extra chromosomal DNA, those three could be, would become six, but it could be six and zero, or five and one, or four and two, or three and three. So think about what that actually means for a second. It has two implications. One, you've actually just doubled the potential high copy number in one cycle, and you've increased the variance, which Darwin showed us as the fuel for natural selection. So this has profound implications. And we have a paper that just came out a few weeks ago in Nature Genetics, um, done with evolutionary biologist Ben Werner, with Howard Chang, with Benit Bafna, Wendy Wang, um, Anton Henson, and others. We basically show that this is really what's actually happening in cancer. So instead of getting an equal distribution, you get a bell-shaped curve distribution. And this allows cancers to change their genomes at light speed. And this has profound, profound implications for why cancers become resistant to treatment so rapidly. We then began using a tool that Vanit had developed to look at how common this is in cancer. And the answer, it's very common. We, we know that in upfront cancers, it's probably at least close to 15% of cancers and the most aggressive cancers. And we know that patients whose cancers have it are much more aggressive tumors. We also think that in over time, it may occur in patients so that it could be up to a third of all cancer patients at some point have this problem. And that's when we also realized these patients are different. And we started the biotech company, Boundless Bio. Um, and I'm very happy to tell you the story of that one as well. But I wanted to give you a sense of the arc of the work. No, I, Paul, you, you tell your story so beautifully. And like you said, um, looking backwards, it, it is so linear how it, this is able to kind of transform and, and build out your work. So it's so inspiring to hear from you. And, you know, Thank one you. thing I wanted to, to wrap up um, as we kind of wrap up the conversation, the overview, um, I, you know, one thing that really stuck out that I kind of wanted to continue back on is you, you mentioned the, 
with your father and just kind of the background as a physician, what kind of bothered you in oncology? This was the, the fact that this is not solvable and it's, it's, it's horrible. Um, I, I can really imagine that your background as a physician influences your current scientific research, but I, I'd love to see that vein uh, throughout history. Can, can you tell us more about that bridge between the early stage research and, and clinical training and how that influences? Oh, this is, you've asked such an important question because um, when we actually think about medicine and we think about changing people's lives through science, we're talking about a very, very, very complex ecosystem. And the truth is when things were simpler, um, you had models of how we did science. And there was academic science and then there were pharmaceutical companies. Um, that world has changed. How people do science has changed. How we fund science has changed. So first of all, there's a process now that runs all the way from the most fundamental discovery and chemistry through functional biology, genetics, chemical biology, to proof of principle and proof of, proof of concept, to drug development, clinical trials. Um, and biotech is now plays a critical role in this process. If somebody is going to make a difference through science, no lab has everything that's needed to solve the problem. We need to work in a very different kind of a fashion. And that actually means going the full spectrum and all these, nobody possesses that full range of expertise. To bring it back to your question, there's a role for physician scientists who understand aspects of those pieces, who can bridge fundamental discovery to medicine. They may not be able to control and understand each point in it. For example, you know, how many will be chemical biologists, right? Um, but uh, there's great expertise along each of these components, but if they can understand and participate in this process, this is extremely, extremely important. We're in a period because we live in a, a, in increasing specialization where science and medicine are splaying apart instead of coming together. The opportunity for bridging science and medicine has never been greater, but the practicality of it has gotten harder and harder and harder. I'm very committed to training physician scientists who want to bridge that gap. In fact, the, my decision to come to Stanford University is in part driven by my belief that that's the place we're actually going to get this right. Um, and, and the reasons that I say that are we cross disciplines at Stanford easily. I remember when I was being recruited and Chaitin Kosala, who uh, at that time ran ChemH, is now run by Carolyn Bertozzi, who just won the Nobel Prize. Yay, Carolyn. Uh, but, and Chaitin now runs the Innovative Medicines Accelerator. But we were out to dinner and Chaitin said, Paul, you don't really fit in anywhere, do you? And I said, no. And he said, well, that's great. That's why we like you. You know, I mean, that really speaks volumes about Stanford. So having physician scientists who see that vision and colleagues who have expertise across those domains and learning how to work seamlessly with those individuals is really important. And the spirit of collaboration has never been more important. I'll give an example. My colleague, Howard Chang and I, we write papers together. We share postdocs and students together. We interact very closely together. This is the new model of how we do science. So Cancer Research UK, um, and who was the major funder of cancer research in, in the UK, and the NCI teamed up on something called the Cancer Grand Challenges. And they had a very different model of fundamentally team science that's ambitious, that's interdisciplinary, that's not cordoned off by specialty, but that integrates in a profound way to go after the problems. And they nominated nine areas of research that they thought were most important. And they picked extra chromosomal DNA as one of them. And they had, for these nine various areas, they had, I believe, 165 or 167 teams applied. And our team was awarded one of the $25 million grants. This is remarkable because it gives us the opportunity to do something that I think is rather unprecedented, which is we bring together people with profoundly different backgrounds from physicians, 
uh, clinicians, physician scientists, genetic, yeast geneticists, chemical biologists, um, immunobiologists, mathematicians, evolutionary biologists, people with wildly different backgrounds to integrate to do this kind of work. It's the future of how we're all going to do science. But this is only one part of the ecosystem. If we're gonna make a difference for patients, we also need to be able to make medicines for those patients. Having the experience of being a founder of Boundless Bio and working with a world-class venture firm, uh, Arch Venture Partners, and then building a syndicate around it, have the pleasure of working with Jonathan Lim, who's the chair of the board of Boundless, um, the CEO of Araska, working with Christina Burrow at Arch, and then bringing in the CEO, Zach Hornby, and the extraordinary management team that he's built. For me, the privilege of being part of this has been incredible, and to see how we go from science to medicine. And early on, I just want to give another anecdote. Um, I had worked very closely with Ben Cravat at the Scripps for years, and Ben is a force of nature. He's brilliant beyond belief, and he's also not only is he a great scientist, he's a great person. And Ben is also a co-founder uh, of Boundless Bio. And early on, I'd had no experience with starting a biotech company. And I asked Ben, you know, when I told Ben the idea, he said, we have to get you in front of Arch. Um, and, and, you know, now we have additional funders that are amazing. Um, but early on, when we were just starting, I asked Ben, you know, Ben, how do you, how do you, help, right? How do you succeed when you start a biotech company? How do you, how do I help? What is my role? And, and I went to school, right? And what Ben told me has served me very well. Ben said, if you are the scientific gatekeeper for your company, your company will fail. Your goal is to help it take flight and give it wings, to give it your time, your advice, to help it in any way that it needs you, including helping it help it identify the right people, help the team as it's going forward, put in your thoughts and understand your role. And that, you know, that advice has really served me very, very well. I, I hope it served Boundless well too. <laughs> I, I it's you know. Paul, you're able to give such an amazing perspective across the entire chain. Um, and I hope this is inspiration to our audience of physician scientists out there looking to see how they can get involved in, in startups, research, uh, and, and just everything above. So thank you so much. And I, I think just on top of that as well, um, going back to the main story a few minutes ago, we want to just dive into another thread about mm -hmm. and just surrounding extra chromosomal oncogene mm -hmm. amplification. So I want to pass it over to Chris to, to dive deeper into these subjects. Mm. Just super excited to hear more. Thank you, Drew. Uh, second everything Drew has said, Paul, and I think I could ask you questions for the next two hours, specifically <laughs> on this topic. But you've given us a phenom some phenomenal context, not only historically, but also on some of the technologies and the colleagues and the people along the way who really made this understanding possible. And so I think the way I'd love to hear a little bit more is to project this out now into the future. Yeah. and say, now that it seems clear that this new understanding of extra-chromosomal extra oncogene uh, amplification and really chromosomal instability at large, not only has the potential to advance our understanding of cancer pathogenesis, it's essential to doing so, especially with regards to things like drug development and resistance. Yeah. And yeah. so as we think about this understanding in this new field, if we, if we can call it that, of linking genotype and environmental interactions and thinking about these drivers uh, through oncogene amplification. How can we continue to improve drug development? Where mm -hmm. is that link, as you just described, going from the physician research into medicines for folks? Wow, that, that's really a great and very nuanced question, Chris. So let me try my best to answer because there's a lot of important parts to that. So, so the first is, um, Let's take it from an academic side first, and then we'll talk about it from the biotech and the drug development side. So from an academic side, I think like all really interesting things, what it actually has done is opened a new door, uh, created a different way of thinking about one of the most fundamental aspects of cancer, um, and opened a lot of questions. So the, the kinds of questions that remain are, how does ECDNA form? right? Mechanistically, how, how does this form? And are there points of vulnerability along 
the path towards formation or how does it maintain itself? Is there a machinery that's different or is it the same machinery used in a very different type of way? How does it affect how genes are transcribed? How does it affect replication? How does it affect the repair process? Very fundamental questions about the biology. The transcriptional world is also different because working closely with my colleague, Howard Chang, Howard has really identified some very different, Howard is a real expert on transcription and has really identified fascinating ways by which these ECDNAs, we call them extra chromosomal DNAs, function in a very different way transcriptional. So first of all, they transcribe like crazy because you have more RNA coming from more template. Because of the mechanism of inheritance, you have tons of template, but it goes beyond that. We showed in the 2019 Nature paper that the chromatin is more accessible to the transcriptional machinery. And it also is regulated in a different way. Normally, when we think about gene regulation, we think about these loops and these neighborhoods and enhancers talking to promoters inside these loops. What if you turn everything into a circle? Now everything is really close and our normal buffers that would prevent promiscuous interaction aren't gonna work anymore, right? And then these things can move around the genome, creating new interactions. So there's a whole new level. And one of the best parts is we're not the only people working on this. Our colleague uh, Rovir Hawk is working on this, Anton Henson is working on this, and now all of a sudden lots of people in the field are working on this. A third area is, could we read the fossil record of the DNA itself? to understand what are the events that might've happened. We're working with Serena Nick Seinel, who really has been a pioneer in, in this kind of work. Can we learn from patients? This is really important, right? Because studying what happens to patients over space and time with treatment is really important. We're working very closely with Meryl Jamal Hanjani and, and uh, uh, interacting very closely with Charlie Swanton from the Tracer X studies. And uh, Chris Bailey is spearheading those efforts. It's a wonderful team where we really get to learn from patients. You know, everything we learn about um, targeted therapy and, and the successes in targeted therapy have largely come from anticipating what the resistance mechanism is. So if the drug works, you're gonna get a change in the sequence that will mean that the drug isn't gonna bind there anymore. So then you know what the next drug is. But if you have extra chromosomal DNA, and they can swap in and out oncogenes on these circles and change the copy number. How, how do you make predictions? Are there underlying rules? So that's where we're bringing in our evolutionary biology and math colleagues, where we bridge computer simulations, evolutionary biology, mathematics with observation and experiment to help us begin to understand those rules, right? What about the immune system? One of the lessons from uh, from DNA viruses is they all find ways to shut down the innate immune system so that tumors can take hold. How is this doing that? Can we turn that back on? So we're working very closely with James Chen, who was, you know, won the Breakthrough Prize for a seminal work on Seagas Sting for that. And then lastly, drugging it. We brought in Ben Cravat, who I've mentioned before, his brilliant uh, uh, chemoproteomic systems to try to understand these both as discovery tools and for future leads for, for uh, pioneer probe development for, for new drugs. So those are the areas that we think are important. The, one of the best things that's happened is we're not the only ones working in the space. It was lonely when we started. It is now tons of people are working in the space. You see papers coming out in high profile journals from other groups all run, jumping in to extra chromosomal DNA. That's one of the healthiest things that can happen in a field and controversies, right? This means a field is healthy, it is moving forward. So I think the academic world is gonna be busy for years as we try to understand the fundamental biology. Now, what does it mean for doing something for patients, right? That's where the biotech space becomes important. I have great conviction and of course I'm biased as a founder and chair of the SAB, but boundless will be in the clinic. I think we're going to make a difference. I strongly suspect that others will come in too, because this is, you know, boy, if you can make a difference in potentially up to 33% of people with cancer and the unmet medical need, the patients who are not responding to traditional therapies or to targeted therapies, to immunotherapies, the amount of difference and misery that you could prevent 
would be just enormous. So I think there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in this space as well. Again, <laughs> Boundless is a remarkable company. I'm sorry not to make, I don't want to make a shameless plug, but it is really, I'm excited about where we're going. So I think we are in for a period of a lot of ferment and a lot of activity, both in the biotech and in the academic sphere, and hopefully interaction between them. I think that's a great segue, actually. And thank you for your thoughts there. I know the question was <laughs> significant, but I want to pass it back to Drew to actually talk about that translational entrepreneurship and learn a little bit more about Boundless. So not shameless at all. Please tell us more. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, Paul, you're a co-founder and SAB chair of Boundless Bio, which builds on your work with extra chromosomal DNA. Um, can you just briefly give us an intro to Boundless Bio here for our audience? Absolutely. So Boundless Bio is a biotech company um, that was actually launched, I think it was about 2018, um, that's really focused on the challenge and the huge unmet medical need of oncogene amplified cancers with a real particular focus on extra chromosomal DNA. It's sort of an, uh, uh, been a secret to the field, although it shouldn't be, that patients whose tumors have amplified oncogenes do much, much, much worse than patients whose cancers are driven by other mechanisms. And ECDNA or extra chromosomal DNA is a major driver of that. And Boundless was uh, created to address that challenge. So in terms of essentially a genesis story or how it came about, early on, I, I had, no, had no experience with biotech. And when I started getting people contacting me after the uh, 2017 Nature paper and began to realize that there was something, it was early days and Vineet Bafna and I uh, began talking as well as Prashant Mali, who we knew we were gonna need CRISPR and Prashant had been with George Church on the first inhuman uh, CRISPR uh, papers. And we began to realize there was an opportunity and there were opportunities for diagnostic companies, but I, I wanted a therapeutic company. And I went to talk with Ben Cravat. I had lunch with Ben and Ben said, this is a big idea and I need to get you in front of Christina Burrow at Arch and, uh, and brought in somebody named Keith Lendon who helped us get launched and working with Keith and Christina was amazing. And then Jonathan Lim came in and Jonathan is a force of nature. I mean, he is incredible. I learned so much from working shoulder to shoulder with Jonathan and then brought in Zach uh, Hornby to be CEO. And Zach is, I truly cannot think of a better CEO in, in biotech than Zach Hornby and the team that he's brought in. And I had the pleasure of being involved in bringing in those people are incredible. What Boundless Bio was really doing, and, and I, I just want to take a step back, I felt a novice at the very beginning of this. And, um, and I remember being in bed with my wife, and she said, you owe it to yourself, and you owe it to other people, more importantly, to do this. And I was like, well, then, okay, I'm going to learn. And I had great teachers, right, and great people along the way. And, you know, I asked Ben, will this make me a better scientist? And he said, yeah, it'll make you a busier scientist and it will make you a better scientist. And I think Ben was right about that on both counts actually. And so the experience of doing it, there were so many things that I didn't understand. You know, as academic scientists, we typically think, oh, you've got a target. Ah, you make a drug to the clinic, that's a snap. Oh no, you know, the process that goes in, into drug development, you know, is a very laborious, serious process that is as scientifically rigorous as what we do in academic labs. You know, the people that I've trained, half of them go into, I've had three people go to Boundless, as well as three people go into outstanding academic positions. You know, people do whatever is best for them. The science in both is great. Um, anyway, I've had the pleasure of watching as the company went from first, well, this is a cool concept, is it real? And watching how the company had to independently validate every single piece, which they did, which made me feel much better. That is the right way to do things. And then the question was, well, cool idea, but is it druggable? Can you find targets that you could potentially drug? And then the answer was yes. And then, well, okay, you know, can you actually make drugs then? And it's been thrilling to watch the evolution 
um, the biotech company to the point where it will be in the clinic, you know, and to watch how you really do go from discovery science to making medicines for patients. We're on that journey, right? Uh, and that's really been a thrill to watch. And I have learned an enormous amount because it's a company filled with great people. Th thanks so much, Paul, for the overview. And, and, you know, best of luck to Boundless. We're so excited to see the next steps. And, and now just a step going forward uh, through Boundless and just your amazing insight into the personal side of, entrepreneurship, academia, and, and just the blend of all of those together with research and physician science. Um, would love to get more on the personal side as well, setting up your own lab, speaking about entrepreneurship. Um, you know, what are your thoughts about mentorship and, and lab culture overall? Boy, that is such a good question, Drew. And it's so interesting because I was actually speaking with a trainee yesterday and I had the opportunity to tell him a story that was very actually quite meaningful to me that I'm going to relate to you, um, which was I had I I had mentioned to you my uncle Walter Michel, the very famous psychologist who had done the marshmallow test and whom I was very close to, and early in my I have to say he was the person who I learned the most from about being a scientist, uh, and and early on in my career when I was starting my lab, he looked at me seriously and he said, Paul, how do you mentor? And I looked at him and he said, you do it with a yellow pad and a pen. And what he meant was you do it by listening. You harness the creativity, you release, actually not harness, you release the creativity of those around you. If you run your lab by telling people what to do, then what you'll get is people doing what it is that you want to do. If you create the culture in your lab, and that's a wonderful strategy for many people. That's not my strategy. My strategy is I'd really like brilliant, creative people in my lab who want to tell me what they want to do. And my job in running the lab and in mentoring them is to help them find the path for making a real difference and to do so through conversations. Because I'm opposed to telling people what to do, the only way that I really know how to mentor then is through conversations because the lab has to be coherent. The pieces have to talk with each other. There has to be a strength in the overall thrust as opposed to a bunch of disconnected efforts. And so the only way that I know how to do that is with conversations. And I think I have had the great fortune of having outstanding people in the lab, but of course it's self-selected because they're people who want that challenge. One of my former graduate students, uh, David Nathanson, who's now a professor at UCLA said to me, you know, Paul, there were times in my training that I was so frustrated with you. I'd say, why on earth will he not tell me what to do, right? And now I'm saying, thank you. And so, you know, I think that says a lot about the mentorship style and what I believe is really important for mentorship. But of course, everybody's different. But for me, this is the way that I really like to mentor and the kind of culture that I wish to establish. I, you know, I, I love that, Paul. And just continuing on the thread of that as well, we have a lot of PIs that are at every stage of, of building labs, creating cultures of their own. Do, do you have any other advice uh, for PIs out there seeking to, bring out a more entrepreneurial culture or just seeking to broaden um, their, their breadth of mentorship skills? Yeah, I, I do. I, I think it's very interesting. We learn by listening and not by talking. Um, and in our culture, particularly in academic culture, we're often, I think, in some subtle ways, I wouldn't say encouraged, but people feel the need to demonstrate their capabilities and often their independence um, by showing what they can do. But there's not a whole lot of learning that goes on in that. There's a whole lot of learning when you actually go talk with other people out of a, from a standpoint of curiosity. So for example, if you're not curious at every point in your career, you're not continuing to learn. So it's not just like, oh, I'm an assistant professor and I want to be successful. And then I'm not curious anymore about learning. If you're not learning, 
your whole life, you're missing out on an opportunity. So how do you learn? You, science is social. You talk to people. You ask people what they're doing. You learn from them. You seek their advice. You build an amalgam of information from all that you get. In poker, the person who wins the game is the person who gets the most information. Yet somehow people don't understand how vital that is in science. It's about information. And so what I'd urge PIs is to understand the social context of science and to develop our careers, we need to be people who are curious so that we continue to learn and gain information and the wisdom of others. And my experience has been that most people are very eager to share. They like to share. It's a social culture. Being a scientist is a thrill and having the opportunity to share information with other people feels like a gift. I, I, I think I, I, I speak with, with Chris and potentially our audience here. I could speak for hours more. Um, time flies when you're, when you're speaking on the frontier of science with an amazing PI as yourself. Um, I, I've been so inspired and, and just love the conversation we're having today. Um, I think the quick transition we have here as we're closing things up is we like to end things a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, I wanted to pass off to Chris real quick to go through a few rapid fire questions just sure. to end off the episode. But once sure. again, thanks so much, Paul. Thank you, Drew. Chris. Thanks, Paul. And we've talked a lot about the professional today. You've guided us through, as Drew said, one of the frontiers of science that you're helping create. And at the same time, you've weaved in a bit of the personal, which is always phenomenal hearing more about your motivations and those who you've, not only you've worked with, but who have been influences and who have been lucky enough to receive your influence. So I'd love to dive a little bit deeper into that vein just for a moment and ask, what do you like to do for fun? Oh, great. I love to spend time with my two marvelous daughters uh, and with my wife and my dogs. I am an exerciser. I'm an avid yoga doer, a runner, um, a walker and a hiker. I love to cook. I love to eat. I love movies. I'm a big reader. One, again, one of the great lessons that I learned from my uncle is the value of a full life. Science should, is not, is not um, being a monk. It's being engaged with the world and having a really good time. And I have a really good time. I love to hear that. And it's occasionally taking that step back to go to France and reflect, it sounds like, as well. <laughs> no kidding. Some inspiration. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. Well, as, as we do come to a close, did you have any other closing thoughts, shameless plugs? Is there something we missed that you'd love to, love to share with us today? No. As a matter of fact, it's actually been a pleasure for me. You've given me a chance to reflect a little bit on my life, and I've enjoyed this thoroughly. So thank you both. Absolutely. And how can our audience learn more about your work? I'm sure they're going to be clamoring too after this. Email me. I'm happy to talk to anybody. Well, thank you, Paul, for an absolutely incredible conversation and for the access. That's not, that's not common, but it's, it's phenomenal. I know our listeners just had just as much fun as we did, and we're very grateful for your time. I did. A pleasure talking with you guys. Thanks, Thanks so much, Paul. Bye-bye.